primary school, a thing called the Selective High Schools Placement Test. And if you do well enough, you get an opportunity um, to be part of the Selective High School. Up until 2010, shames me to say this as an educator, that was not available to children in Western New South Wales at all, unless they left home. They could leave home and they could go on board um, somewhere like Yanko, for example, um, or if they wanted to go to just two, we only have a couple of three boarding schools um, in, the depart in our department. If you wanted to participate in somewhere like Sydney Girls or Sydney Boys or North Sydney Girls or James Roos, your family had to up sticks or find someone for you to live with or, you know, make whatever arrangement you could. We didn't have that provision. And we put a case up at the time to say that we could deliver that level of education if we used all of these tools synchronously to connect with our kids. So this year we have 120 students between years 7 and 10 um, who are involved in the program and they have four residential schools of two days per year, so that's two days each term, but the rest of the time all of their work is undertaken virtually. And that just gives you some idea of the spread of where the kids are located in this home school communities right across Western New South Wales. So we've got kids down, you know, on the lift go end and kids right out to Broken Hill um, across those four years of seven to ten, as I said. And all of these images are images of some of our Excellians um, at work. And you can see them in the top image undertaking their science uh, practical work and you can see them video conferencing. They have every week they have a school assembly. They just don't actually have it in a hall like um, they do at their home school, they have that virtual assembly um, through video conferencing. They are supported in their home school to do their practical placements um, for their, their practicums for science, because we haven't quite yet worked out how to do all of those digitally. It's a bit tricky with test tubes and stuff and keeping kids safe when you're just telling them what to do through the internet. But maybe that's something that um, increased bandwidth and broadband services through the NBN might be something that we'll be able to tackle um, into the future. Okay, so that's not going to work either. I was going to actually show you the kids at work um, to show you exactly how uh, the kids are going about learning in that modality. They use um, their DER laptop device and they use an internet um, web conferencing program called Adobe Connect for what we call their Synops. Now, Synop is a synchronous learning opportunity. Now, if, you go, if I go back just quickly to that map, um, it's two time zones. Um, so you can imagine timetabling classes, if you think how timetables used to work in your old school, is a pretty tricky business across um, two time, same time zones and across 32 different sites. We have one rule in Excel, and that is that if you're teaching in the program, you can't teach a student who's in your home school in Excel. Okay, so I might be at Bathurst High, and I can teach kids at Cobra and at Broken Hill and at Ningan and at Warren, but I can't teach a student who's there. You figure that's a bit of an unfair advantage if you've got face-to-face -face time. So what we do is we get all 32 schools over the Christmas vacation to send us their timetables, and then we worked with a company to develop a really sweet little piece of software, and it finds all the common times that actually exist for the teachers and for the kids. And from that, we schedule our synopses. Um, that synopsis are 20 to 25 minutes in length, and that's the face-to-face -face teaching time, absolutely using the internet, um, using the Adobe Connect product. The remainder of that time we use for what we call the asynchronous learning, we use a learning management system, um, which allows the teachers to actually place work and to um, interact with the kids um, in a, basically in a text-based environment, but there are chat pods within that as well. We're learning an enormous amount about what works for children in terms of learning through our experiences with this program. One of the um, really amazing things has been how successfully these kids are learning. Now, I acknowledge up front that these kids are very bright, but in making this comparison with the cult results charts I want to show you, this is comparing them with like kids. So this is the 2011 ESSA, the Essential Secondary Science Assessment, and I'm comparing here average performance for our Excel kids, and the green bar is the Excel average, and the state average is the blue bar, and the red average is the region-wide average, and the SS full average, the blue bar, that is the 18 fully standalone selective high schools. So I'm talking about James Roos, Sydney girls, Sydney boys, North Sydney girls, North Sydney boys, 
And you can see that the Excel kids, this is 30 kids who've done all of their science for three years virtually, apart from their school-based cracks, they're outperforming those people in the bricks and mortar environment. And I was really loath to show this to anyone for, you know, most of the last 12 months, just a little bit internally, till I got these last week, the different actual colour set, but yet again, next cohort of kids equally performing, just slightly above. They're closer to the blue line, the SS average line this time, they're only just marginally above, but that's because I need to take three kids out who weren't even in the program and actually did the test. I take those kids out, the kids that have been with us, for the whole of the time doing their secondary science, they're outperforming kids. And you can imagine as a teacher, I've got a fairly high degree of interest in why is it so? Like, why is it that when we're putting kids in standard classrooms that you would think would be the best possible learning environment, with all of those resources, teachers right there, ready to hold your hand, how can it be that kids get, that get 20 minutes, you know, three or four times a week in a synops? How could they possibly be outperforming people that are in that more advantageous historically positioned. And, you know, like anything, ask the customer, the kids can tell you why. And one of the things that the kids tell me assiduously about why they find learning in Excel easier, they say it's about questions. They tell me all the time that when they have to put their hand up and ask a question in a standard classroom, they're careful about what they ask. They're careful about what they ask because, one, they don't ever want to appear stupid. Who has not felt like that? I'm not putting my hand up to ask a question, but I want anyone to think that I'm a bit not with it. Two, they tell me, that because they're fairly bright kids, they often face a bit of flack when they do ask a question. You know, you should know that, you know, you're one of the smart kids, that sort of stuff. Within the particular web conferencing tool that we're using for the Synops, there's a way in which the kids can raise their hand and type a question, but they can set it up in such a way that only the teacher sees their question. All of the other kids in the class don't see the question. And the teacher's able to um, see very quickly if there's a pattern developing, that clearly, you know, everyone's, you know, quite a few people actually aren't getting this, and they can change their teaching and adjust to it to cope for that differentiation. Or conversely, they can pick up that, you know, Mary's having a bit of a problem today, she's clearly not actually getting it. And just that one little difference is one of the things that the kids consistently highlight is making an extraordinary difference for them in terms of their learning. The other thing that they tell me is that, um, that on, there's never nothing to do in Excel because of the combination of the synchronous and the asynchronous learning. And that the pressure, of, 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 not so much the pressure, but the consistency of that work, um, they, they actually, in terms of volume, they plough through it much more than what they do when they're in their home school in some of their base classes. Okay, so this is, you can see it's a pretty typical Excel learning environment. Most people have a room, say, of something like the library, where they go to. You can see their little, um, their small DER laptops. They're just at little workstations. They've got headsets for their audio, so they're not bugging everybody. And they have their webcam um, enabled um, on their machine, so they can see their teacher. I love this photo. This is our very first ever res school here in Dubbo. And this is our current year 10, when they were in year 7, when they were little tackers. Um, predominantly, um, they are still with us, and at the moment we're looking at how we're going to take them forward um, as our first HSC cohort, because um, those kids will go into what we call stage six next year for their high school certificate, which will be um, pretty exciting. And so we're working with them to identify their course selections and all of those sorts of things to put the program for them together. Um, and we're certainly looking forward to some pretty outstanding results from those. And that's just a little quote um, from one of our Excelians about, um, about how they find um, learning in Excel. So that was all about, to some extent, the past, giving you a bit of a sort of a broad brush about what's been happening in terms of ICT and education in the schooling sector um, over the last little while, probably with a bit of predominance on what's happening in the, in the secondary space. So now it's time, I guess, to try and um, for me to hazard some guesses about what might happen in the future. Our previous speaker, um, in that fantastic example about you know, thinking about going on their holiday and you know, putting an island on Facebook and being um, bombarded with push notification, you know, push marketing, I think there's a real opportunity for push knowledge and for push education. 
And, and at the, one of the things that we're playing with at the moment is having a look at a lot of tablet technologies and the, what's BYOD, bring your own device, and actually looking at the sorts of things that the kids are actually getting for learning and how we would be able to integrate those sorts of devices um, into their learning in a program like Excel, for example, and indeed into their general high school. And I was watching a group of kids just a couple of weeks ago who for sport were doing walking, which I always I think is a bit odd, but um, can't say that I ever volunteered for walking as a teacher because I did, it was quite pleasant, particularly in the autumn and spring, um, go for a bit of a walk with the kids. And they'd done a bit of a lap down around, we've got a lovely walking track um, down around the river here. And um, when I was down up near the old railway bridge the other day, um, there's some beautiful signage that the local council have done. I don't know if people seen what I'm talking about down near the railway bridge, we across the river, the, right down the end of Macquarie Street. And there's a marker, and on the marker it talks a little bit about that just past the abutment of the bridge is where John Oxley and his team actually encamped when they were um, exploring New South Wales. And I thought about this in the context of a whole bunch of year eight and nine kids who were clearly walking for sport and they were walking on the river pathway. And I thought to myself, as you do just in a moment in time, wouldn't it be good if all the phones that are actually in their pockets, because <laughs> I know for a fact their phones are in their pockets, suddenly gave them a little alert telling them about where they actually were and to stop and have a little bit of a look around about how in terms of um, white exploration of western New South Wales, that's a bit of a significant site. And wouldn't it be equally as important when they're up at the zoo end, um, where the plaque in memoriam to Tracker Riley is, where it talks about how, you know, in our history we've made some really dumb decisions, so dumb in fact that those decisions have led to the death of a child. Wouldn't it be good if the same thing happened if the phone in their pocket, that their tracksuit pants buzzed and they got a little sense of that story? I think there's an enormous opportunity to look at how push knowledge, how push learning um, can actually happen into the future. I think that the ubiquity of tableting devices and all those sorts of things has really big challenges for us. Um, it has challenges for us in how we uh, teach kids to be safe digitally and have good cyber citizens. Um, and how to look after themselves um, effectively in terms of the internet and for us as teachers to make sure that they're engaged appropriately in learning and that their time is spent productively as opposed to non-productively. I, I, like you, have read all those surveys about various companies right around Australia where, you know, employees are spending about 30, up to 30% of their time actually, you know, surfing the net and booking a holiday and um, looking at their Facebook entries. And that's equally possible in a one-to-one -one computing environment in schools right now. Um, with lockdown networks and stuff, though, we have some control over it. But we really need to keep the focus absolutely and assiduously on learning. And I certainly think that mobile technologies and the things that kids bring themselves um, to school um, is something we've got to learn to capture and explore, uh, how we make those just part of the everyday um, learning and life cycle of a child. Uh, I think we've got to look at ways in which um, we ensure that we're developing in our kids the very um, things that were spoken about right at the beginning of the day, that entrepreneurship. And certainly as I have the opportunity, as I do each term to work with those Excel kids, my goodness me, if they're not the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, I don't know who are. They are the ultimate multitaskers. You know, at the same time that they're participating in their synop, they're uploading to Moodle a completed assignment, they're sending the teacher a question about last night's maths homework, you know, and they're probably also just talking to each other, you know, um, if there's two or three of them in, in that particular space or sending a message off to another friend who might be working on a project. Just recently...